The question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Kyle McGinn. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's a pleasure to get up and talk on the Charitable Trust Bill 2022. Um, as uh, members would be aware, I'm the member for Mining and Pastoral. And this has a massive effect uh, within my electorate um, and has a long history um, within my electorate. Not all good. Um, and I know the Honourable uh, Nick Garan did touch on uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things that have happened, um, and particularly uh, more recently. Um, but this has been an ongoing issue uh, for a very long time. Um, and I, won, uh, for one, am very happy that the Attorney General has taken this issue on um, and has uh, put his shoulder to the wheel in respect of looking at reforming, I think, uh, 1956, I think it was 1962, uh, Bill, so it definitely is a little bit outdated. Um, as you would all be aware by now, I'm definitely not a lawyer, so don't expect as technical of a discussion as what we just got from the Honourable Nick Garan. Um, it would be uh, probably a little bit more on the coal face that you'll hear from me throughout my... <laughs> I'm only just firing up, Dan. Um, uh, it, more on the coal face about what uh, I see on the ground um, and what I've heard on the ground. Um, and what I think uh, moving forward needs to be a bigger, a, a bigger, uh, a better space uh, for TOs and native title to operate in. I think uh, you know you go back to uh, over 100 years ago and where we are today in, in, in respect of First Nations rights in this country. There has been significant steps, um, uh, referendums, uh, the right to be included. Uh, the right to vote, um, native title. Is all that perfect? Um, I think a lot of people will argue um, differently around native title um, with different views. But it is a step, I believe, in the right direction of ownership of their land. Um, I, I had the absolute honour of um, being a close mates with a guy called Brian Manning up in uh, the Northern Territory. Brian was a, was a wharfie who... Uh, he uh, worked on the wharf for most of his life, um, and he was the guy that used to drive out to the Gurindji strike, the Wayfield walk-off, uh, every week with his old Bedford truck and drop off, uh, drop off food supplies, flour, water, um, everything he could to help support their fight for land rights. And uh, we all know what happened uh, with that dispute. Um, I think it was over eight years of, of uh, sitting down at Waddy Creek and... Um, going through what was the first real opportunity for First Nations people to get rights to their own land. Um, and what we've seen happen from there on uh, is an expansion of that process. But then comes your charitable trusts, uh, your royalties that come through there. Um, you've got major mining companies where we're, we're talking about dealing with massive amounts of money here. Um, and I, I think... To put it in context, you know, you're, you're dealing with companies such as your BHPs and your Rio Tintos and your FMGs and sometimes all of them in one area. Um, so potentially uh, just millions and millions of dollars going through this, this, this charitable trust. Um, and I think sometimes it can be uh, very difficult, particularly um, when potentially there's not an agreement within that uh, organisation. I know if I was to think about some land right issues, uh, I would look, look straight back to the Muckety dispute, um, where in the Northern Territory there was a decision made by the federal government um, who went out and spoke to one TO out of the five TOs in that area. Uh, four said no and one said yes to an area becoming a nuclear waste dump. And when I say that, I mean that literally, just a concrete hole in the ground, no real, uh, no real understanding that that's going to leak into the water system, um, you know, and, and create major, major issues. I, I know Rum Jungle, for example, is another land rights issue where that's just out of town near uh, Bachelor in the Northern Territory where the, the company never cleaned up their mess and there was a community that suffered with tumours and all sorts of things that came out of that. Um, and this goes back to, I think, the fundamental issue with uh, First Nations rights in this country is not having a voice. 
Um, and I mentioned it earlier this morning, um, how passionate I am about seeing uh, our First Nations people create their own voice, um, Treaty Truth, Makarata, in this country, um, which will be put to a referendum, from what I understand, with the new federal government. And I want to just put on record here that I believe everybody in this chamber and everybody uh, listening should sell that message. Mm -hmm. Get educated about what the voice is. Get educated about the Makarata. Um, there is a, there's a man called Thomas Mayer who uh, was uh, a leader of the MUA up in the Northern Territory who's written a couple of books about the uh, Uluru Statement, um, about his journey of going along with elders and uh, taking the Uluru Statement from the heart, the actual uh, document, which was signed by 1,200 uh, leaders around this country, Indigenous leaders. Um, and he's been travelling non-stop for five years now, constantly trying to get support up. Now, we are in a position now where we could see a referendum to give the opportunity for our First Nations people to have a voice in this country, to be able to tell the truth about what happened, to be able to reflect honestly around what happened when, when this country was invaded. And that, I believe, is the only opportunity. Only then will we be able to move forward as one. Um, I, for one, love hearing on Australia Day the stories about the massacres, hearing about what happened, hearing about where communities were driven out of areas. You know, one of, one of my uh, things that, and I know she's on urgent parliamentary business today, and, she, and the uh, Honourable Rosie Sahana has a real, real view on uh, charitable trusts, and I know she was looking forward to putting some comments on the record. But one thing I'm really, really proud about is that we're in a chamber this term with the first Indigenous woman in the Upper House. The first Indigenous woman to be in this chamber has happened in 2022. Seriously overdue. Seriously overdue. But what, what that's added, and, and I have to say I'm quite lucky because I share the electorate with the Honourable Rosie Sahana, and uh, I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, she has one massive story to tell in respect of where First Nations rights have come um, for TOs and with charitable trusts. But she also has a really sad story to tell around the stolen generation and the truth around what happened. Um, you know, the, the, I, I believe she's writing a book and I think every member in here should, should get hold of that because um, her life story in respect of her father and the stolen generation is, is really touching. So back to charitable trusts, um, obviously uh, I think that there are situations at the moment where you see TOs and um, uh, particularly PBCs, et cetera, that have uh, royalties running through from a native title that do work uh, in, in a decent way. But then you also see uh, the example that the Honourable Nick Grant spoke about, Looking at that report, um, looks like it would hurt your back carrying it around, the Honourable Nick Durant. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> I've got no doubt that the Honourable Nick Durant has read every single page of that report. Um, <laughs> um, but, I, but I reckon the Honourable Nick Durant has probably read almost every single page in that report. Um, I'm surprised that I didn't see the multicoloured uh, stickers on the side. Um, I usually do that to make it look like I've read. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Normally, I do that to make it look like I've read. Um, yeah, but uh, but uh, oh, look, look. At the end of the day, if I'm, I'm sad to hear that that is if, actually a technique. If, if if I'm anybody, if I'm anybody, I'm a man of truth, um, and uh, my missus would laugh. But street smarts is where I come from. Not so much lawyers. So. Um, but look, touching back on this one, not just about my uh, uneducated experiences, uh, I'd like to get back to obviously uh, where this all came from. And it came from that report um, in respect. It came from the issues that came out of um, uh, a Nyamal inquiry report and the recommendations that came through there. So um, the background and the history was the 6th of December in 1962. That was when the current act came into operations. Um, that is a very very long time ago. There has been some changes, though, um, in that time. Uh, in 28, uh, 2018, we did see uh, the Attorney-General uh, table the report uh, that the Honourable Nick Graham was referring to, which contained 21 recommendations 
um, and sub recommendations for improvements to the law and to the charitable trusts. On October 5, 2020, the Cabinet approved the drafting of the bill to repeal and replace the current Act. Uh, in 2021, June, a uh, consultation draft paper, the Charitable Trust Bill was sent to the 14 stakeholders for comment, including the DPC Aboriginal Policy and Coordination Unit, the Ombudsman, the ACNC, ORIC, Law Society WA, WA Police, Information Commissioner, CJSCWA, Public Trustee, DMERS, WA Bar Association, the Charitable Law Association of ANZ, Senator Dodson and Alan Sefton, SC. Um, Senator Dodson uh, is an amazing uh, member of parliament as well. I can't uh, talk highly enough about the work that uh, the senator does in the Kimberley and across uh, Australia as a whole, the man known uh, for reconciliation. Um, and I can see why the Honourable Nick Aran would be interested in to know what the submission was. Um, but again, I think I could go up and have a good chat with the senator. The record there. Sorry. Because I, I know you're, you're doing this genuinely. I don't necessarily need to have the submission of, of Senator Dodson. Yeah. Just were concerns raised by any of the 14 stakeholders? Yeah, look, I will actually correct that. You did say you didn't want to know who raised the concerns, just what the concerns were. Um, but again, I, I know that I could probably go up um, someone could probably go up and just knock on Pat's door and have a chat with him because he's a pretty open guy. Um, I, uh, I think I'm heading, I'm heading up to Broome tomorrow, actually. The Attorney General can't do it. He wants to keep it so between, behind Attorney lock General's and key. I've been in the Kimberley quite a bit, um, I have to say. I've seen uh, the Attorney General in Kununurra, I've seen the Attorney General in Broome. He gets up there quite often. <laughs> <laughs> just develop, saying. The Minister for I'm Regional. just saying, I do know that the Attorney-General's been up there and, uh, and talks with stakeholders. I think even the Parliamentary Secretary's been up to Broome. Um, you know, so we're... I think the whole Labor caucus has been up there, haven't they? <laughs> that, was, that was Caratha, I think, um, oh, right. Honourable Member. But I think the Liberal Party went to Rottnest, or that was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. That was a good year. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to go that far. I was. Uh, I was. Gonna, I was trying. I was trying to be genuine. Then. <laughs> Sorry about that, honourable member. Oh. Cool. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, the leader. The leader is the leader who is on uh, urgent parliamentary business. Will read the transcript and and uh, and. <laughs> Oh, she's probably listening right now and probably going to get a text message in a minute saying, get on with it. But... Well, if I could bring you back... <laughs> if the chair could bring you back to the topic, that would also be very much appreciated. Acting, pre acting president. Please, please draw me, uh, draw me back in, because um, uh, unruly interjections are getting to me. Um, so there's, uh, there are four key parts uh, to this bill. Um, the first yeah, schemes for property held for charitable purposes, um, and that's part three of the bill. Um, secondly, the investigation of charitable trusts by the Attorney General and the newly established Western Australian Charitable Trust Commission, uh, constituted by the Ombudsman, uh, part four of the bill. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary, I would be interested in knowing more about how uh, that newly established uh, commission is going to be constituted. Um, obviously, it's uh, by the Ombudsman, but would be interested to know the makeup potentially of what that uh, is going to look like. Thirdly, uh, proceeding in the Supreme Court in relation to charitable trusts, including to better regulate individuals involved in administration of charitable trusts. And I think that the point here is that there's people involved in these charitable trusts that aren't even involved in the native title or the TOs. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Parliamentary Secretary. But there's people involved with the charity trust that have actually no stakeholder rights at all with the TO or native title. So they can be brought in from outside, for example, that aren't actually connected to the native title. Trustee, they might be yeah. if it's a corporation or something of that kind. And I think that, again, uh, has caused a lot of uh, difficulty, particularly with um, uh, PBCs. So the fourth uh, is permitting certain trusts to make a tax-deductible gift to eligible recipients uh, for philanthropic purposes where those recipients have connection to government, such as public hospitals, museums and art galleries, and that's in part six of the bill. It also preserves the charitable trust status um, of certain recreational facilities 
and provides protection for liability for people performing functions under the law. Uh, each part um, and how they differ from the current Act, there is obviously going to be a lot of changes. I'm intrigued to see the uh, second reading response by the Parliamentary Secretary to give us an, uh, a proper understanding of all the changes that, uh, that have taken place. Um, and uh, I can assure you that I believe the Honourable Rosie Sahana is watching as well and does want to put some comments uh, on, on the record when she comes back uh, from urgent parliamentary business uh, maybe next sitting week. Uh, so I am looking forward to see this bill get uh, enacted and see some changes happen within charitable trusts. Uh, I will like to put on record, I do want to see some changes within the native title as well, um, particularly the lack of native title determination in the goldfields. Um, I have to say, five years working out in the goldfields, I can tell you that not having native title determination has caused a lot of angst um, and has caused a lot of issues in the goldfields, um, particularly failing to let us move forward. Um, and that has been, that has, yeah, in the Murchison as well, there are a couple of other areas. I, I, I speak highly of the goldfields because I know that there's four or five groups and it was really disappointing, uh, Acting President, that uh, the Goldfields Land and Sea Council, who had the de determination rights for native title, was stripped of that right. And I understand that there were reasons, but then <laughs> there wasn't really any focus put on the goldfields to then, with the new uh, determinant, go out there and actually get determinations done on native title. You know, you've got mining companies that have been working there for years and years and years with total backdated on royalties that would add up into the billions, I think, if you were to put it all together from the goldfields. And even mining companies now, um, believe it or not, which shocks me, are lobbying federal government for a determination because there is genuine want to work together on progressing um, the First Nations economic values and voice and culture within the goldfields. But you can't do that without the determination. Um, and you only have to look up at, look at the Kimberley as a prime example. Um, and I, I'm sure um, everyone in this chamber, including the Honourable Nick Garan, has heard of Yaru. Yaru do a fabulous job. Um, and uh, if, if you haven't been up there before, the Honourable Nick Garan, I, I strongly suggest going up and meeting with Yaru um, up, up in the broom, because they are an amazing uh, corporation and what they do and how they look after their people and how they utilise the royalties that come in. Um, I think if there's an example on what I'd like to see happen roll out is very similar to that. Um, and then you had the Noongar determination as well, um, which I've seen roll out across to Esperance. And uh, I think it was Gail uh, down at the Esperance, uh, what's the name of the Tatarak? Unbelievable what they're doing down there in respect of you know, looking at housing, for example, and how they can invest in housing to ensure that generations of Noongar people can own their own house in the Esperance region. Um, absolutely amazing, but that came from native title determination. And that's where you get up towards Norseman and you've got the Naju, and then you move up from there into the gold fields and there hasn't been determination. So, uh, so I hope the uh, parliamentary secretary is listening to me very clearly on native title. I know it's a federal, it's a very big federal issue, but I think um, it is definitely a disadvantage to the gold fields not having that, uh, that voice enshrined out there. Um, and. This bill will go a long way in ensuring transparency um, back into the system and I, I thank the Attorney General for taking the time to work hard on getting this bill to, uh, before us in the Upper House today and thank you Mr Acting President. Mm -hmm.